Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. First, let me bum you out and just tell you that I do not know the meaning of life as such. So if you're here to, to learn it in 15 minutes, I'm sorry, I can't deliver it that fast. And the reason for this is, is multiple. First of all, let's just problematize the question, because that's what philosophers do, and that's what we keep on doing. The reason why the question is difficult is that it implies a very definite, single meaning to life, that there is the meaning to life, as in that there is one, that we can find this meaning to life and simply hand it over and give it to somebody as if it's an object. Like, here you go. There's the meaning of life. I figured it out. There it is for you. And even if I did know it that way, I would think that largely it would not be completely meaningful for me to simply hand this over to the person because it would be like an answer to a question they didn't even know they posed. Now, the existentialists in the 20th century argued, Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir in particular, that the reasons why this is the case are multiple. So Sartre argues is that nobody can simply hand this over to you. You cannot just have one meaning, that there's multiple meanings and they cannot be handed top down, is that they have to be explored from the inside out. That is, the quest or the search for meaning is what's important here. And Simone de Beauvoir argued that really the ambiguity of the question is embedded in the fact that there's an ambiguity to life itself. Life is always in a movement, it's always in process. So it's very difficult to have a final answer to this question, but we keep on asking it because we have to ask it, because the alternative according to Nietzsche, in a very scary quote, because Nietzsche likes to write very dramatically, is this. So Nietzsche is writing this in the 1800s, shortly before he passed away and before he had uh, serious health issues. And he writes, when I relate the history of the next two centuries, I describe what is coming, what can no longer come differently, the advent of nihilism. For some time now, our whole European culture, he's writing out of Germany, has been moving towards a catastrophe with a tortured tension that is growing from decade to decade Restlessly, violently, headlong, like a river that wants to reach the end, and then no longer reflects, that is afraid to reflect. So nihilism, for a very quick definition, is the notion that there is nothing that's inherently meaningless about anything in the world or the universe itself. Nietzsche thinks it's a particular problem at that time period, because like the present moment in 2022, at the time in which he was writing this, Europe was going through massive changes and upheavals is that the traditional institutions that had anchored life for human beings for centuries, if not millennia, mainly the church and the state, were falling by the wayside with the advent of science. And that what was a centralized meaning, largely given to people by religion, just no longer was there. And he was afraid of this meaninglessness. And he thought this was a fundamentally not just a philosophical problem, but also a psychological problem, a problem of nihilism. Now, that quote in context, following what happens afterwards in Europe, you have World War I, World War II, a number of other disasters and catastrophes, and the changes that we're experiencing now, technological changes, changes in, well, a pandemic that we've all lived through for two years, and a number of other changes, are even of a profoundly larger scale than that which Nietzsche experienced and that which people during Nietzsche's time experienced. So we're always forced to ask this question, even if we're never going to have a fundamental or definitive answer, because even when you get to something resembling an answer, New things arise, life changes on you, and it keeps on changing, never stands still. And as Viktor Frankl puts it, who lived through the Holocaust, that life is not primarily a quest for pleasure, as Freud believed, or a quest for power, as Alfred Adler taught, but a quest for meaning. Both Freud and Adler are a psychiatrist of the 20th century. So Frankl believed that a way to understand psychology is, and human behavior is through the fact that what we are looking for fundamentally is to find something that makes our life meaningful, whatever that may be. And that the search for this is just as important as having any final or definitive answer. Now, let's just give a small attempt at an answer of just some general categories of the existentialists that we're talking about. So Nietzsche is one of the first existentialists. And along with him are two thinkers in different places, Kierkegaard in Denmark and Dostoevsky in Russia. I won't be talking about Dostoevsky, but here's Kierkegaard. So this is a very, very rough outline of what Kierkegaard has in mind in the 19th century. He wrote from the standpoint of pseudonyms. That is, he made up a whole bunch of different people up, which everybody knew was really him, because Denmark at the time is not a very big place. And from these pseudonyms, what he was trying to capture is the variety of perspectives of people trying to figure out what the meaning of life is. So often, what you put in the mouth of one pseudonym, let's say the aesthetic framework, will be fundamentally different from what we put in the religious framework. And it changed over an authorship that spans about 25 volumes that he wrote in a very short amount of time, less than 15 years. But roughly speaking, he says that these three spheres that give people meaning. First is the aesthetic, which is the experience of art. 
And again, to refer back to our pandemic, part of what happened during the lockdown, for instance, is that people turn heavily to art in some way, shape, or form. Whether it was consuming art in the form of watching movies or playing video games, which I think are now art. Uh, whether it was in the creating art writing, whatever it is, reading, all of this was a way to anchor people and to make sense of a very, very large world event. Now, ultimately, what Kierkegaard argues, the problem with the aesthetic, he never argues this, he sort of shows it to you. He never just tells you. So the problem with the aesthetic mode of life is that it's fleeting, is that art experiences pop, they come and go. So he describes one particular instance where he is trying to have a, what he calls a repetition, for instance. So to repeat an experience that he had at a play that he saw in Germany. This is a, a fake person, Kierkegaard writing the fake person saying this. So he says he sat in the audience for this play, had a deeply meaningful experience at one moment. A year later, he travels to the same spot, and he tries to recreate this moment. He's like, I sat in roughly the same spot. It was the same play. It was the same kind of people. He's like, but it was no good. The seat was too hard that day. The lighting was bad. I just couldn't recapture this moment of meaningful experience that I had a year before. A year before. And that it's never in principle recapturable because it always is, in fact, going to change. So therefore, he says, instead of that, we should really turn into two other spheres of existence, although he never abandons the aesthetic, which is the ethical and the religious. So in the ethical sphere is one that argues or asks the question of what is right and wrong, roughly speaking. And that the ethical sphere, he says, really starts with just one choice, and that choice subdivides into a million different choices, like we saw in the talk on autonomous vehicles, that there's ethical questions embedded in virtually everything that human beings do. And this one choice is simply to be ethical or not. The aesthetician doesn't leave, live for the sake of ethics. They live for the sake of artful experience. The ethicist, though, makes a choice, a choice to be good or evil. The person in the religious mode of existence exists at least in one part of the authorship in what Kierkegaard calls a teleological suspension of the ethical. Now, what he means by that is actually super complicated, but a very rough version of what he means by that is this. In the, in the ethical, there's a set of precepts that we can communicate logically to all of us. That is, I can give you a lecture on right and wrong, a lecture on ethics. We can dispute the points and the subpoints, but it's guided fundamentally by logic. We can all understand that it's universal. For Kierkegaard, the religious doesn't function this way because it's asking you to step out as an individual over and above the universal. That is, he says that the religious is a moment of experience where the single individual is elevated above the universal. And because of that, it's so paradoxical that the best you can do is talk around it. You can never directly capture it in human discourse. And that's why his authorship is so giant and there's so many perspectives talking around this particular issue. He calls this a kind of leap. Now, for Kierkegaard, this is fundamentally embedded in Christianity. But in contemporary scholarship is that there is people looking at Kierkegaard's work from a number of different viewpoints, from all over different religious traditions. And depending on where you ask, he either sticks to either the aesthetic, the ethical, the religious, or sometimes he blurs them. Now, one of the things that Nietzsche and Kierkegaard were critical of were their predecessors, the German idealists, who they thought were way too abstract way too metaphysical, way too caught up in analyzing concepts for the sake of concepts and doing academic philosophy. But I think it, neither Kierkegaard nor Nietzsche are being entirely fair to the German idealists because they did, in fact, have concerns that we would call existential. Uh, Kierkegaard at one point says that, that Hegel is like a person who's built a beautiful mansion and then lives in the shack next door instead of living in the actual mansion because that's what the systematic approach of Hegel is. But again, I don't think it's fair to Hegel. Now, for Hegel, meaning of life is actually not that complex of a question. He thinks of it in terms of a complicated education that begins when you're young but continues to lifelong, as a lifelong process. He calls it building. He calls education as the absolute determination and therefore liberation, that is a moment of freedom, and work toward a higher liberation. It is the absolute transition to the infinite subjective substantiality of ethical life which is no longer immediate and natural, but spiritual, and at the same time raised to the shape of universality. Now, the reason why Kierkegaard made fun of Hegel a little bit is because he wrote like that. But you know, what can you do? So he does write in this weird, weird, dense way. But what Hegel is actually saying is something that is not particularly difficult. Ethical life for him is simply what we're doing here now. It's the life of a people in their concrete community talking to one another and doing tasks that they have to do in order to help the whole community out. 
So the students ask me, can I give a talk on the meaning of life? I said, no, I don't know the meaning of life, but I can give a talk on it. So that is ethical life. It's just that. I'm the philosopher at U of M Dearborn. I show up for a talk on the meaning of life. As simple as that. Now, it's not really that simple, because this, for him, is a really, really, really a lifelong project of learning, is that this part of your education is just a tiny, tiny amount. You have, what, four years, five years, depending on how long you're taking. If you go to grad school, 100 more years past that. I'm kidding. But only about seven. It's OK. So, but even past that, it never ends. Is that, so it's an ongoing process. And the way that Gadamer captures it, talking about the same notion and jumping off from, from Bildung, Gadamer is a 20th century philosopher who is working within the field known as hermeneutics. It's a theory of interpreting texts. And without going into too much detail of that, Gadamer is using the similar kind of framework. He says that as following Hegel, we emphasize the general characteristic of building or education, of self-cultivation. Keeping oneself open to what is other, that is, to what is different from you, to be more universal, to, to other more universal points of view. The universal viewpoints to which the cultivated man or person keeps himself open are not a fixed applicable yardstick, that is, this is not mathematical kind of thing, it's an ongoing process, but are present to him or her or them only as viewpoints of possible others. So that is, in the framework that Gadamer is talking about, we must expand their educational framework, especially philosophically, to look at not just what people have written in the past or now, but to as many human standpoints as possible, looking at concrete histories and concrete developments in order to understand both ourselves better and thus the world better. And this can be a process of generating meaning for both ourselves and for others. So this approach of self-cultivation or building, I tend to tie my courses explicitly to other standpoints, such as Aristotelian virtue ethics or Confucian virtue ethics coming out of China, where the idea of self-cultivation stands in front and center. And this is, I mean, uh, the other thing here within, within those traditions, uh, within, let's say, the Chinese context of, of Confucius speaking about this. This process of self-cultivation, of becoming more and more ethical, there's no easy way to, to put it down. There's no, like, straightforward answer. It's a process. And Confucius says it took him 70 years before he got there. So that's what we're <laughs> kind of arguing for in some ways, is a lifelong process of going through this. Now, to end here, I want to end a little bit with, with Schelling, who was a Hegel's one-time friend and collaborator in a number of journals. And they essentially invented what it becomes known as absolute idealism together. They were roommates in a, in a seminary. So what Schelling wants is similar to what Hegel wants, except Schelling is the early inspiration for a lot of the existentialist ideas. So he wants this heavy theoretical approach combined with an existential approach. Kierkegaard was in attendance in Schelling's lecture. The one time that Kierkegaard left his hometown was to go to attend Schelling's lectures in Berlin. And what Schelling is arguing says, if I see a philosophy, the means of healing the fragmentation of our time, then I do not thereby mean a feeble philosophy that is a mere artifact. I mean a robust philosophy of the type that can measure up to life. So what he wants is an inclusion of negative theory, he calls it, negative philosophy, conceptual, theoretical philosophy, that is dependent on logic, that is dependent on language and the connection between those two things, along with the very difficult to capture process of life itself. Because life never neatly is going to fit into any theory, no matter how large and overarching it is. And Schelling's realization sets off later on a number of flurry of investigation, even as people are deeply disagreeing with them. So to summarize, is that what I've pointed out is that one, this is a very difficult question, but a question worth asking, a question that we're likely none of us are going to have a final definitive answer to because life just doesn't lend itself to it. But we must keep on asking it. And there's a method to do it. There's a philosophical method. This is what I think the existentialists left philosophy out of the picture, where the German idealists did not. For Hegel, for instance, philosophy is the highest point of exploration towards this question. Thank you, everyone.